Hello, everybody. Pleased to meet you all. Uh, so I'm Juan, he's Ariel. Uh, we both originally created the engine uh, as an in-house tool for a very long time. I think Ariel is going to be going down a bit of the memory. Uh, the goal of this talk is that uh, we have been working very hard for a very long time doing the engine, like 20 years or something like that, uh, doing technology together. Uh, and uh, the thing is that things happen, uh, we, we move on from things. Uh, I also, the past two years, haven't been that much involved for personal reasons. So the thing is that we really want to like, share with this presentation a bit like what was the initial drive, what were the reasons, uh, how Godot came to be, and also how the world needed to make it like a, a very thriving open source project with so much uh, contribution, community, how, how we try to make this project happen to make it grow as much uh, as it did, at least from our part, of course, because Godot is a community project. There's like hundreds of people contributing. There's super valuable people who joined the project, like Remy, who's a program manager, who is amazing, and many of the core contributors. Uh, but I wanted to like say a bit how was the process to just like put the direction of the project towards the growth uh, and why, why we believe that this, this was achieved. Uh, so I think we should probably start talking a bit about like, where the project comes from, why it is the way it is, uh, and I think it would be nice that Ariel can, can tell this to you. Hello, thank you for coming. Yeah, so I'm gonna go over the first slides. Is there a... Oh, okay. Yeah, so... <clears throat> yeah, so Juan and I were for, for, from South America, Argentina, and uh, yeah, we met in the, in the 90s in a, a BBS. It was like before the internet. We met there, and yeah, we like to make games. And so, yeah, so at that time, the industry, there was no industry, basically, in Argentina. And so the industry kind of came up from the people, you know, our generation who wanted to make games. We had access to computers suddenly because of the situation of the country. And so we, you know, we started making games and that became, you know, companies and, you know, people doing, going into the, the industry. And, you know, at that time, uh, game engines were not uh, really used for, uh, were not general purpose. You had game engines for FPS games, like the FPS game was the first kind of type of game that would use an engine, but it was also very um, limited to, you know, uh, desktops and, you know, you, you didn't do an engine for everything because of, well, because of many reasons. And so, you know, you had to make your engine. You, you, you started a game company or a game project, you had to make your engine and then make your game. So we, you know, we were, uh, in the early days of the industry in Argentina, we started some companies and we were kind of like the engine people within those companies. Uh, uh, you know, I, I guess we liked it or we kind of fall, fell into that role a little bit. And so we created, uh, you know, engines, uh, many kind of generations. I always say Godot is like the fifth generation of like the engine that we were making. Um, here's some screenshots. There's a lot more. There's a lot more versions of this. But... Uh, yeah, um, so we kind of became the engine people in the industry a little bit for, for those first years. Um, so, <clears throat> yeah, so South America, it's like, it's unstable. It's uh, difficult to invest there. It's, um, you know, the, as I said, like we had access to computers in the 90s and then not so much in other, you know, decades uh, or, yeah, and, and that depends on like, you know, the particular situation, every week is different or, or something, you know, so sometimes you would, sometimes the industry would grow a lot, uh, for example, in the, I would say mid 2000s, the industry in Argentina was bigger than in Brazil, for example, right now, not so much. 
And it all depends on like, you know, what the government is doing, what the economy is doing. So it's very, uh, very unstable. In general, the result of that is nobody will go there and invest because, you know, you invest, you're thinking about 20 years, but everything can change, you know, tomorrow or in four years or whatever. And so, <clears throat> yeah, it was a low, you know, it grew a lot because of the, in the 2000s, there was this big wave of like outsourcing, right? Outsourcing became viable, the internet. So a lot of people were hiring, were outsourcing to Argentina. And so uh, what happened was like, basically there was this big, um, you know, Argentina was cheap. And so big companies would outsource and that kind of trained a whole generation of people to work, like train them to work mostly in like these Java games for phones that we used to have before the, you know, before the smartphones. So that was, and that grew the industry a lot, but that was very like dependent on the situation. The dollar was at a certain price, the, you know, the, so it's very, very unstable. And yeah, um, uh, programmers are expensive always, uh, you know, no matter where, they're more expensive than the rest of the team. And so, uh, yeah, you always uh, want to have a team with few programmers, more uh, artists, content people. There's a, a bit more about this in the following uh, slides. So, yeah, we made a bunch of games. Uh, yeah, this is kind of, although this is mostly Godot, but we made a few, uh, well, there's one that's not, that's from before Godot. But yeah, I mean, we managed to make a bunch of games out of our own studio, which was, you know, very difficult, very, but we, uh, and, and we had to grow our own tools and we had to sort of, you know, grow our own capital as well. There was no investment. And so, you know, we managed to make a bunch of games. There's a, one console game here, but there was a couple more. There's, a, you know, some PC games, some mobile games. It was, a, you know, pretty uh, diverse types of games, a bunch of 3D games. And so in this process, the process of making all these games, we learned a bunch of things that kind of inform very heavily the development of Godot. Um, so one important one is all games, the, when they go over a certain threshold of complexity, but that's a very low threshold. Uh, all games, they need custom tools. So you, you, you're, you're never gonna be able to put all the features that everyone's gonna need into your editor, but you, you can do, you can make a tool that makes it easy for other people to make other tools. That's why, in part, that's why the editor the Godot editor is made in Godot because then we know that we can make good tools with this platform, right? So having a tool that allows to make other tools, very important. Another is, uh, as uh, in the previous slides, 80% of the production of a game is content, is artists making, you know, um, all the assets and, you know, game designers, uh, you know, and producers and all these other people, but you know, it's it's content and it's it's not programmers. And so you you want good tools so that the content people, the artists, they can integrate their own content into the game without creating a bottleneck in the programmers. Right? The the classic mistake is you have the artist like making. Uh, I don't know, PNGs and giving them to the programmers to put in the game. You don't want that. You want them to be able to put the, their art in the game, test it and iterate, say, okay, this needs to be changed and I can change it because I have the tools. And so you, <clears throat> so we would, we would have teams where there was like, I don't know, 25 people in the team, but there was like three or four programmers. The rest were, you know, content people. Uh, Computers changed in 2007, around 2007, uh, the iPhone came, came out, the PS3 came out. Before that, you had the desktop, that was like the main computer, and then everything else was like a, a kind of a special case, like the phones, the Java phones, you had to use Java, the Nintendo DS, 
had like four megabytes, megabytes of RAM, you couldn't fit anything there. It was very, you know, you, had to, you couldn't make an engine for everything. And so <clears throat> around 2007, you know, the, the PSP, the iPhone, they were like portables, but they were kind of like a full computer. You could make an engine that goes to desktop and to, the, to those portables. And also the PS3 was like super weird, the cell chip was, you know, very weird. And so that, that uh, made us change the architecture of the, you know, of the engine. And it also made it possible to make a general purpose engine that goes to every, to every computer. You just needed to be ready for some unusual architectures. And so portability is very important and it's, Portability and also like thinking about, you know, what about a computer that doesn't exist, but not too much because you don't want to, you know, you don't want to over optimize for something that doesn't exist yet, right? Juan is going to go uh, over that in, in future slides. And so, you know, portability is important and also, yeah, general purpose engines became possible, but we had to change the the architecture a little bit from the from what was the previous you know the previous four generations of engines. Um, 2D was not dead. I put this here because it's kind of a curiosity. We we thought you know Nintendo with the Nintendo 64 uh, they were like okay three, uh, 3D is everything. Everything is 3D now. Uh, you know 2D we don't do 2D anymore. And people would say like 2D is dead. Um, it's only for Java phones, like, uh, you know, real gamers, they want 3D. And then, <clears throat> and you know, it's interesting that, for example, I don't know, Unity is called Unity 3D. And for, you know, for a long time, they didn't have 2D. Godot originally was a 3D engine with a very good UI. It became, uh, all the 2D nodes came when we were making, well, one of the, the third game from in the top, row, that was a PSP game, and that was a 2D game. And so at, at first we told them, like, just use the UI. You have the texture panel and stuff like that, use it to show sprites. But then, you know, it became obvious that we needed 2D. But the point is, like, yeah, you, you know, you have to be, uh, be you know, we were lucky because, because we have very good UI, we had a very good 2D renderer, so it was super easy to add, you know, the sprites and everything, everything else for 2D. But, you know, you have to be ready for, yeah, you know, new, new stuff, and at the same time, again, like, you know, if it doesn't exist, don't worry about it. So it's a kind of a, a balance. So, you know, we were lucky in that sense. Because, uh, yeah, when the iPhone came out, 2D came back for the, for the first, year maybe people were trying to make 3D in the iPhone and then they realized, oh, these guys are making a ton of money with like the Candy Crush and the, all the other stuff. So, you know, let's go to the, let's go back to 2D. Uh, oh, did I go back? Oh. So, oh yeah, so, Again, because the country was unstable, we had to close the company uh, around 2015. And so we went to work sort of independently as consultants. I, I was uh, more able to, at first, to, to work as like consulting for Godot specifically, but that was, uh, you know, just because I wanted to do that. I wanted to go specifically into like, the more commercial aspect of the industry. Um, but, you know, at first, nobody knows Godot, so uh, you have to do, you know, the work you have, you, the work that's available. But at the same time, Godot was, you know, obviously open source for a few years. We had already joined the um, conservancy. So we had, you know, um, a structure that was big enough to need that. And so, you know, we, but yeah, yeah, it was very early in the in the project's you know development. Okay, so now Juan is going to go into like what it was to 
go full, you know, into the open source project and to develop it and make it grow and all that. Great, thank you so much, Ariel. Yeah, this was like a lot of teamwork over many years. Uh, usually, we would do, we, we would do a lot of technology together. Uh, a lot of times, I would was making technology and Ariel was using the technology and saying this absolutely sucks. You have to change it. Uh, so it was a, this process of like making. We made like five versions of the engine before. Uh, the one in Godot, and even then we rewrote Godot for Godot 3, and then rewrote Godot for Godot 4, and now I think it's kind of there, <laughs> I hope. Uh, but yeah, the thing is, from now on it is to give you an idea of what kind of things were key to drive the engine towards where it went, and where, like, advice for the future generations working in the engine, and how we actually could could keep just going up uh, constantly in, in community features, contribution, uh, so anybody who eventually will, will replace me or, or, or anybody else in the project uh, can, can understand a bit what was the mentality of, of how, how it is. So the rule number one, absolute number one rule you have to do if you do this is you have to listen to your users. You have to listen to your users always. If you look at open source, uh, open source projects, uh, you will see Super, super, super common that the maintainer is like, I know better than all my users, and uh, they have to do exactly the way, the things the way I want, because they don't know anything, and I am the entity here that is completely enlightened and how things have to be done, uh, and I know better than my user. Well, that's, in your case at least, not true. You have to listen to your users. Uh, I believe that humans are really bad at designing software. If you want to like say, oh, I'm going to make an engine like this, and people will use it, uh, you will probably fail because the way you would use it is probably not the way others would use it or maybe even if you use it you will realize this is not the way, probably the best way or, or whatever. Uh, so I think it's very, very important when you're making software for others to use, not for yourself. Limit yourselves to listen, understand the problems very well uh, and only then when you understand the problems that users have, you come up with solution. So. It's also important to just to not judge the proposed solutions before understanding a problem. That is like the, the key thing to me in software development. You will have, if you have a company, your clients, if you have an open source project, users, they will come, I need this. And you will this, well, okay, if you need it, I got it. That's not really to me listening to your users. What you have to do is understand why they need this. You have to, why are you asking me this? Like for example, because, there is a difference. It can be somebody who is making a game and they are stuck because, I don't know, the, the 2D sprites are too slow, right? Uh, and they are asking you, like, I don't know, I want a multi-sprite thing so I can draw many sprites at the same time. But in reality, the real problem was just the sprites were slow, so you had to just optimize them and the problem was solved, right? So you have to just listen very well to what they say, understand the problem, uh, understand that many times the solution they proposed is not really it's more like a workaround they want to do, and they, ask, they want to ask you to convalidate their workaround. Uh, but actually, the problem was something else. So you have to be very, very clear to understand the problems of users before doing a solution. And really listening, not just what they suggest, but also what they actually have a problem with. I think this is key if you want to do any kind of software development that is actually useful. Because also, many people can come and just say, hey, it would be great if we had this feature. And you ask them, do you need it? No, but I think it would be great. Uh, so then you add the feature and then nobody uses it and you have to maintain that feature for years and years and years. Uh, so it's very, very important that what you implement is something that you understand it resolves a real problem and not like what they're asking you to do and not something that is somebody, a speculative problem that somebody thinks it would be nice to have this, but in generally, no, nobody's going to, to use this. So, Second rule is like really, really, really listen to your users. I, as I was saying, you understand the problem and other problems, but like don't try to, this is typical, typical like how to fuck up a, a project. You are listening to a lot of problems and then you believe, you believe you're a super brilliant mind that is going to find one solution that is going to fix all the five problems that different people are having, like, oh, this people has this problem, and this people has this problem, this people has this problem. I'm going to create a huge, all-encompassing solution that is going to solve every single problem and future problems that people will probably also have in this. So my advice here is, like, be very pragmatical, only solve the problems you know people have, and only, like, 
Every problem, give it its, its own solution. Why I think this is very important? Because as a user, when you're using software, there is nothing more annoying than trying to learn how to use the software, and you just want to get something done, right? Uh, but to get that done, you need to learn this absolutely complex, abstract, flexible like architecture that lets you do so many things together, and it's so complicated to understand, and you have to create structures and link elements and graphs and things, only just to do one single thing. And if this single thing is like what 90% of your users do, and they have to do all this complexity just to implement this little thing, uh, you're doing something wrong. Just implement a solution that solves this little thing, not a super complex system that is going to, to do this. So this is very common maybe when programmers are younger that just want to like do these all-encompassing things. Uh, and my advice is just focus on the problem and to each problem its own solution. And only when you have done to each problem its own solution for enough time, and you see that it makes sense to create something that like solves everything together, then okay, go ahead. But don't do it before doing the solutions. First do all the, all the, to each problem its own solution. Only do something more generic when you understand that this really is something that you know that those solutions were really needed and you can actually simplify it. Uh, so, as I said, like users want to solve their problems, not waste time learning engine architecture. Uh, this is why people get into Godot and they find it so simple to use because you are going to look for how to do something. Oh, there is a function for that because every problem, we do our own solution. Um, so, rule, rule three, this is something very important. Uh, people always tell me, oh, you have to think more about usability and things like that, but my experience with usability is that it's not something so simple, especially when you do this kind of software. Uh, when you have an in-house engine, although it was an in-house engine for a very long time, you just need to make one way to solve whatever you need and tell everybody in your team, okay, this is all this way. End of story. But the thing is that people are very different. Everybody uses software, but they don't use it the same way. They expect things like people have their notion that, that then when they use the software and they want to do something, that this is going to work the way they expect. If it doesn't work the way they expect, they will get frustrated. Uh, because for them, it's obviously it should work this way. Uh, let me give you an example. Like, Godot originally didn't even support drag and drop. It was just like click there and like open a dialog, select something. It was very like old school uh, engine. Uh, when we open source it, the first thing is that everybody, everybody says, hey, I can't do drag and drop this to here. Oh, but you can open this dialog and select it, right? Oh yeah, but I want to drag and drop. It should obviously be drag and drop, you know? So the thing is that different users have different expectations of how something has to work. And there is not that right one. You have to support all of them. Uh, because people are different and they have their expectation. And this makes learning the software and getting to get things done a lot more easy. Uh, again, the, the real key to usability is that you meet, need to make sure that nothing gets in the way of getting things done. But this is different for every person. So you have to like do these redundant workflows that are exactly the same. Uh, this way you accommodate more individuals and this magical things happens that you download the engine, you want to do something and works everything works the way you expect it to work and you're amazed. Uh, but the reality is this is fake because we are accommodating you and other five people that do it different altogether. But for you, everything is done the way you expect it to be. Uh, so usability to me is about rather than workflows the most. This is the thing, like just do everything that doesn't get in the way, uh, even if it has to be different for every person. Uh, as you can see here, these are release, release notes uh, from Godot open sourcing to uh, 2.1. Uh, you can see like the, for Godot for uh, one, the, everything I have marked, that it's all usability stuff. People wanted mobile docs, improved code editing features, drag and drop support, uh, live editing, what they wanted to make it like, use it better, uh, improve the interface, there were a lot of things broken with the interface. Uh, like, as you can see like for Godot 1.1, the, the focus, the next focus is going to be modernizing the editor UI, uh, the community has put a long list of usability things, like even for Godot 2, uh, you can see there that we say here, we know the weakest part of Godot is still 3D, it was super weak, it was just mobile 3D. Uh, however, we feel there are several more urgent issues that need to be improved usability-wise. This is for Godot 2 released like eight years ago, something like that. As you can see, like usability is probably 80% of making a software like this. If you want people to use something, it has, usability has to like, priority number one by far. 
Uh, and as I said, because you have to accommodate many, many different ways of doing the same thing if you want it to be usable for a large amount of people. But again, things change. Uh, Godot 2.1 was out. Uh, it started getting a lot more users. Uh, you're probably very young, but you don't remember. I made those images for every engine release. Like, it was it's very old engine lore from a decade ago. Uh, so if you're nostalgic, like, this is a good time to be nostalgic. Uh, but yeah, bigger games made with it, done more contribution. We have so many contributors all of a sudden, and we have to manage, manage that, right? And this is a new challenge, like completely new challenge. That's not just me doing this alone anymore. There's lots of more people contributing. How, how we can accommodate this to make sure we can grow with all this chaotic uh, contribution? So I think it's too many people want too many things. There's everybody like, Everybody wants everything, like, and have very, very big risk of bloating the engine easily if you add everything everyone wants. Like, uh, it, it's, it's sad, but I mean, you may want something, but the thing is that if you're the only one that wants something, it may not be justified, right, to, to add it to the engine, because if everybody wants different things, as I was mentioning before. So we had donations, we had a bit more resources, uh, we started doing meetings to discuss engine features, uh, and I think it's like, we started, people started opening issues, we want this, we want that, there were some pull requests with new features, and then the people contributing to the engine would get together and discuss for hours and hours and hours, like, do we want this to be added to the engine? And others would say, well, I don't know. Uh, do you know? Well, I don't know either. Uh, and we wouldn't know, I mean, it's just, I don't know, some new feature, like, would anyone use this? <laughs> I had no idea. And if we kept adding everything everyone wanted, then we just bloated it uh, very easily. Uh, so we started doing some rules. Uh, and this is probably what a lot of people who follow the engine development don't understand. It's not that anything can be added, because we can't. It would like be three terabytes of engine if we do that. So we have this flow. You can see that they're right. Like, you want a new feature, OK? You would like the engine to have a new feature. So the first question is, does it cover a common use case? This is something that you will use very often. Uh, so you, don't, you will not use it very often. You just need it because you need it now. It would be nice to have it. I don't know. But you will not need it very often. OK, if it's not needed very often, can you work it around? Like, can you somehow work it around? A few lines of code or something that is relatively easy to work around? Uh, if you can work it around and you won't use it very often, then no new feature, work it around. Um, so if you're going to use it very often, or it's very difficult to work around, then yes, probably we want to add a new feature to the engine. It's something that either, if you use it very often, and every, not just you, a lot of people are needing this because they need it very often, uh, or less people may need this, but it's something that is very complex to work around, then yeah, normally you want a new feature, or maybe you want the engine to provide, like, the, the base extensions so you can create your own new feature. Uh, but somehow, either if, either if it's a new feature or, or, or the engine API to create yourself a new feature, it needs to be added to, to the engine. So normally, this is a very old graphic, by the way. It's a bit different now. But if you, want pro if you can program C++, open a GitHub pull request. If you can't program C++, open a GitHub issue. It's fine. I, I hate it when people say, oh, you want this new feature, go program it yourself. That, that's very, very mean. I, I don't like when people say that. Uh, so I think it's totally fine. Just go open a new issue. Now, this, this is not longer the case. We have the proposals uh, for other reasons that we explain a bit. Uh, but it's kind of the same as this graph at the left. Uh, if it's a simple problem and occurs very rarely, you don't need to do anything about that. It's very easy to work around. If it's a frequent problem, you probably want to solve it. Like frequent means you, you, you run into it all the time or, or a lot of users run into it. And if it's a complex problem, yeah, it probably needs a solution. It, either a new feature or something, as I said, to, to do that. So at some point, we got absolutely flooded with issues in the GitHub repository. There were like thousands of thousands of issues. And the problem is, again, like people are really bad at describing what they need. You need to understand the problem they have. Uh, so with proposals, a recent proposal exists. It's not so much, I mean, you can propose a solution for something that you want, but what is very important is that you describe what is impeding you to do uh, work in your game, like, and how serious it is. Like, for example, if you just can't finish your game because you're needing something, that's very important, right? 
Uh, if you need to sacrifice quality or performance, that's very important, right? Uh, so it's very important that we understand the problem you're having while making your game, and not just a, pro a feature that is proposed because you think it's something cool, right? It's much more important to know that people are making their game. We need to focus on people making their games first, uh, and people proposing nice ideas second. Uh, so, pragmatically, the problems users find when making the projects are far more important than proposals of problems they don't have. I mean, if you don't have the problem, probably not likely worth investing much time into that. And the proposals exist so the users have to describe the problem well before describing the proposed solution. So we need to understand what your problem is and then evaluate your solution. So this helps understand better and discuss the potential solutions. It, as I said before, many times the solution is not the same as the one you're suggesting, but it still solves your problem in a way that is probably more easy to implement. Okay, now the other problem is Godot has hundreds of contributors, probably thousands now. Uh, but this is not like having a company. Uh, contributors are not employees. You can't just tell them, okay, you work in that. Uh, a lot of people think that, uh, a lot of people got the wrong idea for many, many years that I'm some sort of like boss in the project. Uh, and the reality is that I never gave anyone any order or anything because as I said before, it's pretty much all people are contributing on their own free time. Uh, and working on what they want whenever they want. Uh, and there's, they are donating their free time. Like, people are just very kindly donating their free time to the contribution for the project. So I won't say, like, hey, you do this. This is needed. Uh, doesn't work like that. So how do we make things happen? Like, if you can't really do like, authority in this kind of development, how, how does it happen? I think is that it's super important, super, super important to do consensus. Consensus is like the most important thing that can happen. Uh, everyone who contributes is, needs to be considered on equal footing. Like you have worked 10 years at the Electronic Arts or you never made any kind of game engines before and you just like the source code and like picking around doing things. Like everybody's considered the same. Your, your previous experience doesn't matter. We all discuss technical things, technical reasons, uh, and it doesn't matter where you come from, like there's nothing giving you any kind of special authority, and that includes me. Uh, technically, on the Godot PLC, we had veto power for features, like, oh, we don't like, like this, we vetoed, but we never really had to veto anything. Everything was discussed, and we went into consensus, and most of what you see in the engine was done this way, pretty much. Uh, so we try to focus on first understanding the problem. Uh, everybody explains their points of view, uh, we ask one question, and then eventually we try to strive for consensus. Uh, obviously, we try to have a group of people who have a like good nature and good will, and they're just not going to just block things because like they they don't. Uh, but there, but it's very important that like rule for contributors that without consensus, if people don't like something, we don't move forward with it. This is super super important. Uh, and and if, if we need to reach consensus and we don't. That's okay, we put this in the fridge. We talk about it on our time. People may soften uh, eventually their, their positions. Uh, but it's very important that we do move forward with something and somebody with, with somebody expressly saying that they don't want this. Uh, instead of this, just put it in the fridge, we talk at it, at it again. Uh, this is very, very laborious, of course, uh, because we, uh, we used to do a lot of sprints, uh, get together with the main contributors, but also like, we put, you can probably see in Godot, we put open pull requests or proposals. There's lots of discussion with the community. Uh, and eventually you see that most people just agree and most contributors agree and then it gets implemented that way. Uh, but the idea is that for the most part, as much as we possibly try this, there has to be consensus. Don't try to force your ideas over somebody else. Uh, if, and don't try to force your, your past experience or whatever, like we have to discuss ideas and the solution has to be something we are everybody happy with. This is something very key to open source. Uh, there's like thousands of people contributing to a project, but you normally can like split between two groups. Uh, ones are the initiators and others are the completers, you could say. Uh, some developers, the minority probably, uh, really enjoy doing something from scratch. They want to make like a new whole feature and they will do all the first implementation to it. And the problem is that doing something, this is one of the great things of open source versus commercial software. Uh, the great thing about open source is that 
the completers, the ones that make the features and the things good, is like these are the vast majority of the contributors, and they donate their time to do it. Like they are using the engine, they don't like something, they open a pull request to improve the usability or, or whatever. And the thing is that the level of polish you can get in software with open source, if you do it right, uh, is much higher than the level of polish that you can normally get with commercial software. Because with commercial software, most of the people you hire, you hire just to implement new features. They are very talented people to implement new things. But most of the people in companies don't like fixing bugs. Uh, they just like, <laughs> they don't like it. Uh, so in general, you will see that open source software is generally a lot more polished if done well than uh, commercial software. And this is great because it benefits, this is why it works so well in Godot, because you have people, less people doing the features, they do it as MVP, like very minimal feature with the minimum functionality. Uh, and this is like one people doing it. You have like 50 people contributing and making it perfect. Like they just fix things, they, they make it better, they improve usability, they make it faster. And this works super, super well. You have to understand this if you want to develop a source software because this is the main strength of, of doing this. So the thing is that, as you can imagine, uh, contribution is completely random because everybody does whatever they want, whenever they want. So most of the work in Godot is community made. People may think that the foundation is developing the engine. That's not true. I would say easily 90% or 95% of the work is just community, contributors doing things to the engine. Uh, the foundation role is mostly having generalists to like plug the holes of things that the community doesn't do because it's so random, or, or initiate the new features that the community doesn't initiate. Um, and of course, a lot of release management, triaging, like all the, all the maintenance part. Like we have to organize all these 500 people contributing to each release. Uh, and the foundation needs people to actually de do, do this. So, so yeah, basically you need the foundation mostly. It's a very small team, but they are doing the things that the community don't, doesn't do, uh, even if it's a minority of the things and most is just people randomly doing. It happened a lot and it's super frustrating and super amazing at the same time. Like we want to implement something, nobody's doing it. So the foundation is like, oh, we need to get a donation for something to work on this so we can do it. Uh, and we find the donors, we find the money, we find the person to do it. And when we're just about to hire the person, somebody makes a pull request implemented, a whole new feature that does everything you are going to hire a person for. And you're like, fuck. Uh, it, it happens a lot, but it happens so many times. Uh, and it's like this, it's so chaotic that you have to like learn to, to work with this level of, high level of, of contribution. Uh, but you still need a central entity to do this kind of thing, like manage everybody contributing, doing the things that are not done by the community, which are very small. Uh, that, that's the general thing. So where we fail? This is the dark part of the presentation. What we do wrong, where we fail. Is it wrong? So saying no is very hard. This is where I think we, we fail the most. We have lots of people opening pull requests, proposals, and everybody expects that if they do this, they will be listened to, they will be given feedback. And people say, oh, you have like 10,000 uh, issues open. Yeah, but we have 42,000 closed. We have 2,000 pull requests open. Wow, we have 41,000 closed. It's, like, it's more like a ratio than actual number of things open, you could say. Uh, but the thing is that, Rejecting things is super, super hard. Uh, when we try rejecting things that people like open, uh, people get angry. Uh, you close a <laughs> pull request for something, people get angry. And because this is like, how can I say, this is mostly volunteer-based work. Somebody who is volunteer, they're volunteering their free time, they don't want to like get somebody angry at them, right? So just the, the prefer, I don't want to close this issue because the, the, the people who open is going to get angry. Uh, and this is, this is really hard. Uh, and at the same time, it's like, as I said before, many times we don't know if something is needed for the project. Uh, it may be, if we see that enough people want it, then maybe we merge it. Uh, if we see that it's a very complex problem to solve, maybe eventually we merge it, but in most cases, it's not very clear if it's something we want in the engine or not. It looks nice, it looks like a cool feature, but if we merge it and nobody maintains it, uh, we're, we're messed up. Like, I made that mistake, I made the visual scripting in Godot 3, 
nobody used it, and we had to remove it in Godot 4. Like, because everybody was asking for visual scripting, but then when we made it, nobody used it, because we understood that they were wanting something else, not just what we did. Uh, so I spent a lot of time doing that, and we had to remove it because nobody was using it, and nobody was maintaining it, so it's like, okay, away it goes. Uh, so it, it's, it's very dangerous, because we, we were delaying releases a lot because there were bugs in visual scripting that nobody was using. And you can't release with a very serious bug and you have nobody to fix it. It's a, it's a chore to fix things on areas of the engine that nobody's using, but they are there and have to be fixed. Uh, so we really are trying to like, we don't merge anything unless we are sure somebody's going to really use it, it's going to solve problems. Uh, and this is why there's so many things open in general, because like, we're not that sure that this is something that's going to be useful, or maybe we don't have somebody that understands enough about this topic to do a proper review or, or say if this is going to be useful. We discuss auto-closing. Like, a year passed, we say, we send a message, uh, okay, uh, seems nobody cares about this. Do you still think it's important? Say, send a message to keep it open. Uh, people still don't want to do that or don't want to see that, so we tend to leave everything open as is forever. No action is better than any action. This, to me, is the biggest problem. Uh, but it's even worse when you are like, you feel like pressure because people are opening so many pull requests and so many issues that, oh, they are working and they spend time on this. We should still merge it, you know? And if you go into that, you're dead. That's where you should never go because you start merging a lot of stuff. You got the maintenance of the engine like harder and harder and harder uh, just to make people happy and one person happy and nobody else that, that, that is using this. So it's, it's very hard, like, saying no is super important and it's super hard, and I think this is the biggest problem the project always had that we could never figure out how to solve. So to summarize, I think usability is the biggest part and priority of Godot. Listening to users drives development, not speculation, would be nice, these kind of things don't, shouldn't drive development, just listening to users. Uh, understanding actual problems is more important than the proposed solutions. As I said, we can't merge everything under the sun. We need to draw the line and say no. Uh, and only enforcing consensus moves a free and open source project forward. You, you, you can't do it otherwise. Uh, development is a delicate balance between community and foundation. Okay, thank you. Do we do questions? What, what is it? <laughs> Two questions. Person there. So I can't see you, there's too much light. Hi, pure of curiosity. How did you know, for example, that the visual scripting wasn't you being used anymore? Uh, basically, we made a poll, we made a community polls every year, uh, asking what people use in many parts of the engine, uh, and it was like 0 0.1 or something like that of the users, uh, and I think many didn't even use it, they just wanted it and just put yes. Uh, the reality is that it, it was very obvious nobody was using it. We, we made many polls and things. The thing is that with Visual Scripting, the mistake was thinking people wanted something like blueprints, uh, because everyone, ah, make blueprints in Grodot. But the reality is that blueprints is not really the connecting things, but all the, like visual scripting in general, is not just the, the graphical way of programming, uh, but you have to give a lot of pre-made stuff to the users uh, to make the game together with that. If you don't do those, th those two things together, uh, then visual scripting is not very useful. And Godot is a very general purpose game engine that is like, designed to do so many things. If you make in, constra in contrast, like uh, Game Maker or Construct, they have a lot of pre-made behaviors. Unreal has like all the character controller with a lot, a lot of things pre-made. Uh, if you don't supply all these kind of things for a specific types of game, it's, it's very not, not useful to do it. And we learned that the, the hard way. Uh, and nobody really was using it. And we removed it and nobody complained. <laughs> that, that's pretty much it. There's also, uh, maybe. Uh, there's also a very good visual scripting system made by the Endless Foundation, which is in ah, the yes. booth over there. So you should check it out if you're interested. A any other question? Any hands there? Okay, Ben.
So what is the best way to get heard when you have a problem, you want to have a feature basically, and there's a, uh, there's a GitHub issue open already, what can I do that uh, this feature gets into the engine in the end? In general, uh, the problem is it's not up to the... One thing that is very, very common is that the people who advocate for a feature think that explaining and reasoning why this feature is important and convincing somebody is going to be the way to get something into the engine. And the reality is that if you want to get something into the engine, there's nothing you can actually like say uh, if nobody cares about it. I mean, it's, you, you open some feature that you believe would be very useful, but nobody else finds it useful. It's very unlikely, no matter what you say or are or whatever is going to make it. It's a very pragmatic development. We know that we are probably missing opportunities uh, by doing this. But at the same time is that we don't know in advance if it's going to be used or not. So we prefer to be conservative and say, look, doesn't seem to show interest. Like, for example, if you look at the Git proposals repository, uh, there's a, a very nice tool that you can sort them by thumbs up and see which proposal have the most community support. Uh, I think there are proposals opened or that usually are combined with pull requests that they, nobody cared about that. Nobody said about that. And the reality is that if we see that the community doesn't seem to really care about it, uh, then we understand that probably the person who is proposing this open the pull request is the only person that would find it useful. And you can do as much argumentation as possible, but we are super pragmatic. And if, like, if, if we can see that this is something that is going to benefit a larger group of people, and especially if you can actually work around this relatively easily or with some way, uh, I think my opinion is that everything should be possible to do, but if it's not like worth it to make it into the core engine, at least it should be possible for the engine to expose what you need to do it anyway. Uh, and I think things that are rejected would still get a good case of like adding the, the extension. This is one of the largest reasons why in Godot 4 we made the GD extension thing, because a lot of developers were creating like engine models, but for that you need to recompile the engine. Uh, and it's like very hard coded and very difficult to distribute what you make because like it's, you have to recompile the engine for every platform if you want to redistribute it, and people don't know know how to do that. Uh, so GD extension was probably the the best way we could think to 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 give developers the power. Okay, we can't make this into the engine, but at least you have this and you can make it right. You can make an extension and you can distribute it, and then people can do it like and. Eventually, if we see that a lot of people are using this extension, it's a really great way to show that this should be in the core engine because lots of people are using this, it's very useful, it should be in the core, en core engine. Just for example, what happened with Jolt, uh, Mikael did the, the Jolt extension. Uh, Jolt wasn't very ready at the time. We knew that we had problems with the physics engine, but like physics was discontinued, Bullet was kind of discontinued, there was no physics engine we could use. Uh, Jolt was very new and very limited at the time. Uh, but for example, Mikael did the extension. A lot of people started using the extension. Then Jared, the author of Jolt, he started doing a lot of work uh, to make Jolt more compatible with Godot. And eventually, like Jolt became a very good solution to replace our physics engine. We was like 15 or 20 years old. I made it like 2007, so you get an idea how old it is. Uh, then it became a really good solution, and it was proven. And now it's going to get into the engine. Uh, but extensions and, and plugins are really good ways to show that people really want something. Uh, if you can still work it around with a script, then if, if people find it very often, great reason to then get it into the engine. But the bottom line, you need to show that there is demand for it. Uh, we have to see that there is demand to get it into the engine. That, that's generally the, the rule for new features. Uh, thumbs up is not the only, I think, as I said before, there are two things. Oh, sorry. I, I didn't realize you didn't have a microphone. Yeah, if giving thumbs up to proposals is the only way to get them accepted, no. I think there are two different things, and this is something that is an ongoing discussion um, at, the, at the project contributor. I think there's two things that determine uh, if something should make it in. Uh, one is the reach, like how many people are affected. Uh, the thumbs up are a very good way to see the reach of something that is wanted. The other is what I like to call the impediment, like how much, how impeded you are to doing what you want to do. Uh, and this is why you want this new feature or pull request or whatever, like how much is it impeding you to do so? As you say, I need to make an FPS and I have no way to do it without this feature, right? Uh, then maybe not many people are making this, uh, but it makes total sense to add it anyway. So in general, it's 
the, the two things that drive uh, if something is needed is the reach, like how many people want it, but also how much is it, it's impeding you to make your game. If it's something that is really like completely avoiding you to make your game, even if not many people want it, it's still top priority. Uh, if it's something that maybe, because you have to think about it, like there's like probably a million people using Godot now, but there's probably like a hundred doing really complex games with it. And they can't get a lot of thumbs up, but they are doing really complex things that they should be able to do with the engine. So if, we are, if they can show like, look, I want to do this kind of game, I just can't because this is not working or the performance is bad, or I need to sacrifice performance to do this, or I have to sacrifice game quality to do this, uh, that is also something that is going to give you like a lot of priority when evaluating. Uh, but it's generally like these two things what drive the, the, like the prioritization on getting into the, the engine. Um, so you already mentioned proposals, uh, and um, to add to that, uh, do you have some other ways potential contributors could contribute to the engine, uh, like how to find out what the engine wants right now, apart from proposals and issues? These are really good question. Uh, this is something that I think this is having a lot of ongoing discussion right now uh, in the engine development because. There's actually a big backlog of things that have to be done that the contributors and the engineer really knows that we have to do. Like, for example, I don't know, everybody wants traits in Jesus script. Okay, well, that's going to happen sooner or later because everybody wants it, right? Uh, but there are things that have nothing to do, like, for example, some translations, or there, there's different, a lot of different things that, that have to happen. In general, for good or bad, it, it's better to just enter the rocket chat, talk to other contributors, see what is needed, uh, I think what the foundation and the project itself really owes uh, is that we, there's like 10,000 proposals open right now that was super popular. Uh, and the foundation like started, but now needs to do it more seriously. I try to review all the proposal and try to tag the things that, oh yeah, this makes sense, this makes sense. Like, so we don't have to reject that. The things that are tagged are the ones that make sense, like uh, approving them. So contributors can see this and see, oh, like, this would be nice to do, and like people who reviewed this thing, it would be nice to do. Uh, so I could just go and do it. I think this is something that is missing right now, uh, together with a roadmap. Uh, ideally, uh, the plan is to publish an engine roadmap at a higher level in general, probably in the coming weeks. Uh, this is already done, there was a lot of work. Uh, so it's going to be an engine roadmap, but in the feature by feature case, I think approving proposals or marking them as something that is wanted I think it's, this is figuring how to do this is probably like the remaining thing. Remember again that the problem is that the project is mostly people donating the, the free time and the foundation is very tiny, so there's no way the foundation can just go through everything and approve them, right? Uh, it needs to be discussed with more people and these people need to have the will to donate their free time to discuss these things. Uh, so it's, it's not, I mean, something so easy to solve as it, as, as it seems. But yeah, the idea is to solve it. Okay, thank you everybody.